Hey guys, Chris the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. You may be wondering why I am lying down on my balcony together with the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 3 telescope next to me. And this is because we have a pretty large amount of wind today and I want to test the Dwarf 3 with its equatorial mode. Specifically, I want to try taking pictures of the Veil Nebula and uh, maybe 30 second exposures on the target with the internal filter of the Dwarf 3 that is a dual band filter perfect for nebulae. And with the insane v wind that we are getting from time to time, I know that it's not going to work well uh, if I leave it be without protection and it is currently protected by the walls of my uh, balcony. <laughs> and by the way, some small things uh, since my last video, I uh, was told and yes indeed it is true that you can move the Dwarf 3 by hand without any issue. So uh, it's simply stiffer than the Dwarf 2. Stiffer by, and by that I mean it requires more force to get it moving, but once it is moving, it is smooth. It's just that it wasn't obvious to me because of how much strength, more, I mean, relatively speaking, it required, and obviously I don't want to break something new like that. So note that this is going to be basically in equatorial mode. I have the tripod very short so that I can have the Dwarf 3 protected from the wind. This is not the ideal configuration to make it slightly more palatable. I made sure to have one leg of the tripod that is facing towards the north so that the weight of the Dwarf 3 is against that leg and there's no risk of tipping. I also noticed that the Dwarf 3 actually came preloaded with uh, several sets of dark frames at a temperature of roughly 30 degrees Celsius. So this is something that I could have used in my previous video but I simply didn't know about it and I'll be using one of those preloaded uh, dark frames at a gain of 60 and I was using 120 last time because I think, I don't know how it ended up there but that's what I was using and so I'll be using gain 60, 30 second long exposures and it should be working for us. Okay, so let's get to it, see how we can set up the Dwarf 3 to use equatorial mode. Okay, and I have now my smartphone connected to the Dwarf 3, just as usual. And I will be going into photo mode. And from there, I will, I am actually already in astro mode. It remembered what I, where I was last time, which is good. And under function, I'm going to try to go to EQ mode. And it tells me the equatorial mode neutralizes the effect of Earth's rotation on target tracking, ensuring stable tracking during a long shutter time and reducing the impact of field rotation on the image, which is absolutely true. Good, uh, good summary. So let's confirm. It tells me uh, to ensure optimal EQ mode setup, please focus your dwarf device first to ensure that the stars are clearly visible. So I actually did this last time, which was a couple of nights ago. So I would assume it's still in focus. And I'll just open it up so that it has some view of the stars because I think it's going to need it. And so I'm going to tell it uh, done already and I hope it's going to be fine and true. And it tells me prepare the necessary tools in advance to facilitate a smooth setup of the EQ mode. A dwarf device, it is here. Apparently it works with the Dwarf 2 as well, by the way. So that works for the Dwarf 2 as well. Uh, a stable tripod, eh. <laughs> yeah, tripod, yes, stable, eh. <laughs> and a compass tool. Who needs a compass when I can see Polaris? Yeah, roughly, I guess. I hope so. It, with the light pollution and the moon getting fuller, it's actually really tough to see Polaris, but whatever. So I'm going to click next. And oh, wow, it's showing my address. Uh, so I'm going to hide that hopefully in the video. So wherever there's a dark square, that's my address. <laughs> and um, mount the device on a level tripod with its back facing north and the lens cylinder facing logo side. Okay, good. Yes, it is facing the logo side, which is actually here. Then uh, tap on next. Okay, still showing my location. It tells me tilt the device towards the north until the angle it makes with the horizontal is the same as your current latitude. 36 degrees, letting the logo face the sky and then click next. Well, I'm going to do one thing better. I am going to actually cite Polaris and right now it should be roughly, roughly accurate. Uh, and I guess you could just also put your smartphone on it and use one of those uh, apps that tell you like the angle of the smartphone to the horizontal 
and get something similar. Would be nice actually if Dwarf Lab could include that function within the app. Like, hey, uh, or you know, put your smartphone on top of the Dwarf uh, Three and uh, and angle it so that it goes to 36 degrees within the app. That would be super cool. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's really pie in the sky, nice to have type of stuff. Let's click on next, and it's going to say checking alignment. What is it doing? Oh my gosh, it's rotating. Is it doing a three-point polar alignment? Yes! That is awesome! Oh wow! Deviation is five degrees. You may proceed with your shooting. Avoid moving the tripod, the unit, or the lens cylinder until the session ends, ends to prevent readjustment. Okay, so if you're not familiar with three-point polar alignments, you don't understand why my mind has been completely blown away, which it really shouldn't be blown away, but it's been blown away because it's the first time I see this in a portable instrument like the Dwarf 3. And it is a feature that's been around for a few years. Uh, it's a feature that's available in software like SharpCap, in software like Nina as a plugin, or in the ZW ASI Air, for instance, that basically analyzes the stars and determines how well you are polar aligned. But it is super cool to see it in the uh, Dwarf 3 like that. So I'm going to say, I, I, you know, I, I kind of wish that it would tell me like five degrees, I actually want to do better. And I would like it to tell me, you know, uh, the polar alignment is good, but if you want to make it even better, rotate the telescope like two degrees to the right or three degrees to the left and, and the angle should be slightly higher, that kind of stuff. Would be nice to have that information. But okay, that's fine. It has determined that we are good. And uh, okay, so what I can do now is I'm gonna actually quickly show you the darks. And uh, if I say take dark frames now, it will actually show me on the left a list of dark frames. And in those, in this list of available dark frames, the second from the top with 30 degree, uh, sorry, 30 degrees Celsius roughly, um, gain of 60 and exposure length of 30 seconds, it's exactly what I want to use. So that's what I will be doing. That's great. I'm going to close the dark frames uh, tool. And now I'm going to go back to function. And this time I will go to the settings and say my shutter speed will be uh, 30 seconds. There, my gain will be 60. And the astro filter will be the dual band filter. Uh, I'll go to uh, function, go back to the main functions, and we'll go to the atlas. And in the atlas, I will search for the uh, Veil Nebula. So let's search for Veil, Western Veil Nebula. That works for me. And yeah, that looks fine. Actually, I am going to uh, select 52 Cygni here and uh, click there. And hopefully, that should uh, help it do the go-to. Yes, point the lenses to cloudless sky, uh, ensuring there are no obstructions. OK. And now it's doing its work like it did before. So it's doing some autofocus, apparently. Uh, this time it's doing it for real. It's taking a little bit of time. Okay. Then calibrating the telescope. So I don't know if you can see it, but it is uh, rotating right now to find the hard stops. And by the way, the hard stops in equatorial mode, they are completely facing downwards. So they are completely irrelevant in equatorial mode. I feel like this telescope is, is made for equatorial mode. Uh, okay. Calibrating. OK, the calibrating in, is done. It took like maybe 30, 60 seconds, something like that. And go to success. That is super cool. So now we have gone to the target. And I will, uh, I guess I'll start shooting. Just the red button. Start shooting. I'll wait five minutes and or 10 minutes and show you the results. So we can have a look at the results together after five, 10 minutes. This is very exciting. OK, and I've waited for a few minutes. Uh, we have 11 stocked frames, so a bit more than five minutes. This is with a almost like three quarter full moon. And from Tokyo, my rooftop here is in Tokyo, Japan, one of the most light polluted on, uh, cities on Earth. And we can start seeing very clearly at the center of the frame the, uh, the Veil Nebula. It's there. And we can even start seeing some of the nebulosity that's residing around here that is very faint. And the stars are, are pretty much, uh, yeah, they're well, 
they're not, they're, there's no big trailing there. It's just working really, really well. And as I can see, like in terms of the number of frames that were taken, 13, only 12 were stacked. So we lost one frame in the middle, but you know, I'm sitting right next to it. So that could be the explanation. Otherwise, it's very impressive what it is doing. This seems to be, honestly, this is a killer feature compared to something like the, uh, the C-Star S50. This is amazing. And you know what? I'm going to test right, I'm going to stop this. And I'm going to test right now with you guys what happens if I intentionally set it up so that it has like terrible polar alignment at first. We have more than like the five degrees that I had earlier to see what's going to happen if it's going to give me some guidance there. So I'm going to end the current session and try again. This is so much fun. Okay, so let me intentionally like switch the telescope quite a few degrees to the left, uh, see what happens. And then I'm going to tell it to go back to EQ mode, uh, confirm. And uh, it is already focused. So I'm going to say done already. And just like last time, we're going to th go through the process. So I'm just going to power it through. And now I'm going to let it check the alignment. And we're going to see what's going to happen. Because if it's as good as I think it is, with such a large difference, it should tell me to go back to the right. Let's see. How good is that three-point polar alignment tool? Oh. That, okay, okay. So there's this green arrow. Oh yeah, that tells me to basically go to the right and hold the dwarf's tilt angle unchanged. So the tilt is good, but rotate the tripod clockwise by about 16 degrees. So it faces true north and then click next. This is awesome. So let me do something like this. I guess that would be roughly 16 degrees. Let's try. Let's click next. And it's doing another three point polar alignment to double check what I'm doing. Deviation is at four degrees. You may proceed with your shooting. Okay, Dwarf Lab, you need to still give us instructions there for the people like me who really want to get closer to polar alignments. But this is so cool. Okay, so what I'm going to do next is I am simply going to go back to the Veil Nebula and we're going to take, I'm going to take exposures for quite a while and, uh, and then maybe like process them. So, so hopefully I'll see you tomorrow with those exposures so we can process them together in PixInsight, see what kind of result we can get with equatorial mode from Tokyo, Japan under a three quarter uh, full moon and with a lot of wind. <laughs> This is completely, this is super exciting, guys. Super exciting. So uh, see you tomorrow with the results. Uh, before we do that, don't forget to like the video if you like this kind of information and tests. You can also leave a comment down below. What do you think of that? And would you buy something like this? By the way, I have the link to the telescope down below. And if you want to help the channel out at no cost to you and you're planning on buying this telescope or anything from Amazon, Agena Astro, High Point Scientific, First Light Optics, etc. If you do so after clicking the links that I have in the description, it helps me out at, again, at no cost to you. Also, I want to say that this video is sponsored by my Patreon members and channel members. And if you too want to sponsor this channel and make this channel possible, you can uh, join the channel as a member using the join button next to the subscribe button or join my Patreon using the link that I have in the description. You guys, you know it, you make the channel possible. Thank you so much for your generosity. Some Patreon tiers have access to my videos early and without ads. With that, let me set, set things up, get imaging on the Veil Nebula and see you tomorrow morning with the results. Okay, well, here we are the day after and I had to stop the imaging after a couple of hours because, simply because we were getting clowns. And also I tried uh, using the C star next to the Dwarf uh, 3 just to compare them a little bit. Uh, but the uh, target, the Veil Nebula that I used was actually too high in the sky. And I ended up going uh, with the Eastern Veil Nebula and I ended up trying 60 second exposures. So the maximum that the Dwarf 3 can do with its internal dual band filter despite having those very windy conditions. So I'll be putting up the results that I have on the smartphone after all of those 110, something like that exposures. And I feel like the, the equatorial mode fully supported is, is kind of a killer feature for that uh, tiny little scope. 
I also did something else. I took another set of dark frames because the ones that were available with the Dwarf 3 uh, were taken at 30 degrees Celsius. But while I was imaging, I saw the sensor was at 39, 40 degrees Celsius. So I retook those dark frames at 39, 40 degrees Celsius. While I did so, by the way, I noticed that the uh, magnetic attachment for the uh, sun filter, which can also uh, double as a dark frame uh, filter, is actually able to fit inside the Dwarf 3 body. This is a much appreciated improvement compared to the Dwarf 2. It's a small thing, but it's nice to see that they, they pay attention to details like that from one generation to the next. Okay, and now how do we get the files from the Dwarf 3 onto the computer? Well, uh, I assume it's possible wirelessly, I haven't tried yet, but for me, I just used USB-C cable to my computer. The Dwarf 3 does need to be turned on for this uh, to work and to be recognized as a drive, but right now it just got recognized as a drive on my computer. Okay, we're on the computer and I actually have uh, this here, USB drive D is the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 3. And we have tons of uh, folders. The normal folders uh, photo seems to include the photos that I took at the very start of my initial uh, review are like first impressions of the uh, Dwarf 3. So they are there, but what we're interested in is the astrophotography side of things. Uh, we have the Dwarf Dark folder that seems to contain the files, the dark frames that I just took with an exposure of 60 seconds, gain of 60, which is the same parameters that I used to image the Eastern Veil Nebula yesterday. And I chose to take 20 uh, dark frames. And also what we have is uh, the exposures that I took yesterday. There they are, exposure times 60 seconds, gain of 60. And I can see we have all of those exposures, 110 of them since it starts counting at zero. And uh, we also have a stacked result, the JPEG stacked result directly from the uh, dwarf telescope. Here is what we get, which is already honestly pretty nice and recognizable as is. We also get, as I can tell, uh, a FITS file. That is the raw stacked frame that we can probably open in PixInsight. So if I open the raw stacked frame in uh, PixInsight, we can see how it looks like. It's very interesting to see that indeed the Dwarf 2 does dithering. You see those lines at the bottom, at the edges, at the top, on the right. Those are definitely dithering lines. And we have almost no field rotation because equatorial mode, which is awesome. What is not so awesome is the fact that the Eastern Veil vale Nebula is slightly off-centered. I ended up using this star there as the center. I should have used that star, but really what we need is a proper framing wizard in the app. I know they're working on it. They're working on a framing wizard. They're working on a noise AI enhanced. They're working on a plan feature. They're working on a mosaic feature. They're working on a lot of things, uh, but I can only show you what I have right now, which is early firmware, early app, kind of beta type of stuff. So we can expect it to get better and better. Uh, that said, we still have the whole object in the frame and it looks pretty nice. But I really want to see what we can get by stacking the frames ourselves, because I know that while the Dwarf 3 was imaging, there were thin clouds passing through from time to time. And that kind of scenario is perfect for something like weighted batch pre-processing in PixInsight. So PixInsight is the software that I'm using right now. It's an expensive piece of uh, processing software. It's almost as expensive as the Dwarf 3, but if you're going full into astrophotography, it's probably the best purchase that you can make. I've actually made a three hours long video that gets you from zero to hero on uh, PixInsight. And they have a 45 days trial if you're interested in uh, trying it out. So what I'm going to do is first, I'm gonna put those frames on my computer. So I'll just like select the darks and the raw frames that we took yesterday. And I'll just copy them into like a folder on my computer. That way we can get all of those frames out of the Dwarf 3 into the computer. And those are my raw frames that I will be able to stack and process. Okay, we are done. I have all of the frames on my computer so I can turn off the Dwarf 3. And so now in PixInsight, I'm going to do the weighted batch pre-processing. So for that, I'm going to add light frames. So I can just choose the light frames from the uh, Dwarf folder that we just put on the computer. So I'm going to select all of those 60 seconds frames uh, all the way to 109. That's what we select, the FITS files. Open that up. 
and then we want to add the dark frames. So for the dark frames, I'll go to dwarf dark, uh, the 60 seconds gain uh, 60 with the temperature at roughly 39 degrees Celsius. When I took them, validate that, and now we have 20 dark frames, all of those light frames. And now I'm adding a folder, Dwarf 3 Eastern Veil. That's what we're gonna use to stack to. I'm hesitating about putting local normalization. I guess I'm going to put it. And then I'm thinking about something, doing something crazy because we've done dithering with the Dwarf 3, which means that in theory should, we should be able to drizzle. <laughs> At the same time, I'm not sure it's gonna be very useful, but in that case, I'm gonna set the debayer me method to the bilinear. And uh, post calibration, we're going to put a drizzle of two with a drop shrink of 0 0.9, and we'll see how well that works. So, drizzling is something that is only possible if you have done dithering, which is in between your 60 second subframes, the scope moves a little bit on purpose so that the same pixels do not always register the same star or the same nebula uh, feature. And that can be used later on to artificially increase the resolution of your image using a, a technique called drizzling that was originally developed, I believe, for the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so now we're good and I'm going to click on run and let PixInsight do its job. So this operation is the stacking of all of the individual images. It basically takes them all, puts, aligns the stars between all of the frames, stack them together as kind of like an average to get a master frame that we can then process. And the master frame will have the best signal to noise ratio. It inherits all of the best parts of all of the individual subframes. Okay, and we are good. We have done the uh, stacking of everything. It took 30 minutes and we started with 110 frames. We lost uh, 12 upon that frame's rejection, which is exactly what I wanted PixInsight to do. We lost some further frames to registration, probably because of poor stars or fewer stars than expected due to clouds. So again, that's perfect. And we end up with a master frame. So let's have a look at how that master frame looks like. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm gonna do a screen transfer function on it, just so that we can see what's going on on that frame and looks fine. Looks very similar actually to the, uh, to the raw frame from the Dwarf 2 on its own, although it does look less noisy. This is the uh, original Dwarf 2, uh, Dwarf 3, sorry, stack. This is the one that we did manually. Anyway, let's do, I'm going to do some quick processing on that using the process that I have in my PixInsight uh, video, three hours tutorial from hero to zero type of stuff. So first we're gonna do some quick background extraction. This is because we have gradients and all sorts of stuff in the background, especially from very light polluted cities like Tokyo. And then I'm gonna do a round of blur exterminator. Blur exterminator is what will let me get the most details out of the image. And that's where we will take advantage of the drizzling that I did, which increases the resolution to get as many details as possible because before I sample down the image back to the original sensor size. By the way, before we do that, I want to have a quick look at the stars. Uh, the stars, there are some uh, kind of weird spikes coming out of them and it's either tracking or optics. I don't know which it is. I would assume there's a lot of it that is uh, tracking, but whatever, it's meh, not the end of the world. And let's run Blur Exterminator on this drizzled image. And we are done. Immediately the stars look much better. This is before and after. And also the details in the nebula actually are uh, increased quite a lot. So if we look at this uh, area, area here, if I look at uh, before and after, looks much better. So now I will resample the image down to this to its original uh, size, simply because that way we gain back the signal to noise ratio that we have sacrificed with the dithering. I'm actually going to use integer resample. There it is. And we are going to sample down by a factor of two because we uh, basically drizzled up by a factor of two. There we go. And now I'm going to run some denoising. And again, I'll be using Graxpert to do the denoise because I really like the results that we can get with Graxpert with the latest 3.0.2 AI model in terms of uh, denoising. It takes a lot of time to go through the process though. 
And we're done with the noise reduction. This is the result. This is uh, the before and after a huge difference. Okay, so now I want to do a quick uh, spectrophotometric color calibration. Oh, we don't have an astrometric solution. So I need to go first to image analysis, image solver. Uh, we have a focal length of uh, 150 millimeters and a pixel size of, size of two micrometers. With those parameters, uh, will it be able to solve the image? Solve the Solving the image, by the way, means it's just going to look at the stars in the image and figure out exactly which stars it wi is which and what the coordinates of the center of the image are and what is the field of view and all of that kind of stuff that can then be used by the spectrophotometric color calibration tool to look at the stars and saying like, hmm, this star should be this color and that star should be this color. It's not going to change the colors of the star or like replace them. It's just then going to adjust the white balance so that all of the stars are the closest as possible to what their true color should be. Okay, we're done with the image solver script. Now we can do the spectrophotometric color calibration. And there we go. The results are slightly funky, but they're decent enough. Uh, we can do a linked stretch now to see what we get. And the stretch is extremely aggressive due to the noise redu reduction that we did. But I think we get the right colors. Oh my gosh, it is really aggressive. I'm going to remove that stretch because it doesn't look good. And let's go to uh, SETI Astro and Statistical Stretch because now we are going to go from a linear image to a nonlinear image. I'm going to put the target median at 0 0.15, see what we get when I take a preview. And yes, that does look actually somewhat pretty good. Let's execute. And this is how what in the end was one and a half hours of data taken across almost two hours looks like after a stretch. I'm going to remove the stars to treat the uh, nebulosity separately from the rest. Again, exactly per my workflow in my three hour long tutorial. <laughs> and now we are done. We can look at the nebulosity in and of itself. It's really amazing actually how much nebulosity we are getting. I'm going to remove the previews and we're going to play with some curves. Okay, this is the before and after of my curve. We are basically making the, the contrast a little bit higher. Then I will do my usual little trick to uh, add a saturation to the main nebula and nebulous areas and then remove some saturations from the background. And this is what I get, which is pretty nice. I mean, again, this is uh, a, a target from uh, Tokyo. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually pretty nice. I'm, uh, I'm impressed. So let's put back uh, the stars. I'm going to use the image blend uh, script to do so. Here we go. I'm going to validate this. This is the result that we get with the stars. And you can see, even though we know we have nebulosity all over the place, the stars distract from the nebulosity. So I'm going to do a final step, which is to reduce the impact of those uh, stars. So we are going to go to star reduction and validate that. See what we get. Uh, and after applying a little bit of SCNR, this is what it looks like. And this is basically our final image. And so we have quite a few details on the Eastern Veil Nebula. I mean, look at this. This is honestly quite impressive. And then we start getting nebulosity also on the uh, right hand side. Uh, but this is again, uh, what, two hours of imaging uh, from Tokyo, Japan with this tiny 500 US dollars thing. Uh, I think that's pretty amazing. And we don't get the field rotation. We don't, we can take exposures of 60 seconds long, apparently without too much issue, even on a night when there was a lot of wind. This is uh, better than I expected. I do think that the optics are probably not as good as something like the Seastar S50. But then, you know, the Seastar S50 without any official e equatorial mode, the Vionis Vespera 2 also without any official equatorial mode, they were not able to even, you know, take images of this target because it was too high high in the sky. So they have their issues. And I do think that the equatorial feature of the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 3 is uh, a killer feature. It also exists for the Dwarf 2. But when you combine it with the, the better aperture, the better sensor of the Dwarf 3, and also I do believe the better optics as well, uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's amazing that we're able to do that. And once they add things like a plan, so we could do multiple targets in a single night, once they add a proper framing wizard to the Atlas, once they add mosaic mode to the Atlas, it's going to be absolutely insane. Even as it is right now, 
I can recommend this. I mean, I still need to test it more. This is not a full review. This is just testing the equatorial mode effectively for the first time. But yeah, this thing, it's pretty good. I mean, let me know what you think of this. Are you interested in buying this telescope? Let me know down in the comments. If you are buying it, by the way, there is the link also in the description. If you use that link to buy the Dwarf 3, it will help me out at no cost to you. If you buy anything from Agena, uh, Amazon, etc., from the links in the description, it also helps me out at no cost to you. Just FYI. And you know, so yes, let me know in the comments what you think of this. Leave a like on the video if you want to support the channel, uh, and it only takes a second. If you're new to the channel, you may consider subscribing. If you like astrophotography, tutorials, gear reviews, etc. I do it all. And if you want to sponsor the channel, and if you want to sponsor the channel and make this channel possible, you can join the channel using the join button uh, next to the subscribe button, or you can join my Patreon. The link is down in the description. This channel would not be possible without my channel members and Patreon supporters. Thank you so much, guys, as always. And of course, we'll have them in the credits of this uh, video. As always, thank you so much for watching. I hope this was useful. And more important than any of that, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.